Welcome, my friends, to another chapter in the Range Ronin Chronicles Pistol Series. If you are on the fence between the 40 Smith & Wesson and 45 ACP, I hope that you find today's chapter useful in making a decision for both caliber and maybe even the pistols being compared in this presentation. So, let's get started, shall we? I was really on the fence regarding the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge for quite a while. With my normal caliber preference for self-defense being the 45 ACP, the 40 Smith & Wesson did not weigh in all that much. I would carry a 9mm pistol at times, not because of any magical properties the caliber would possess, but simply because of its availability and cost. The cost more so over the 45 ACP. The move to 40 Smith & Wesson was a progression, so to speak, from becoming familiar with the 10mm cartridge to deciding that while the 10mm was becoming a favorite cartridge of mine, its power was not needed in the environments that I would usually find myself in. I invested in a Springfield Armory XDM in 40 Smith & Wesson and then a Glock G22 to test the 40 caliber waters. I decided that I liked what I held and shot, but both the XDM and G22 was a bit on the large size for concealed carry in the warm to hot weather months. At first, I passed on the G23, thinking that it was like the G19, a bit short in the grip department for my hand. That was with not even holding a G23. It was just an assumption on my part, Actually holding a G23 Gen 4 changed that line of thinking. For carrying the 45 ACP cartridge, I had selected the Glock G30S, so I felt that it was an excellent size for concealment, and, after all, it did hold 10 rounds of my favorite 45 ACP ammunition. This was actually a surprise choice for me, considering my fondness for the 1911 pistol. Glock pistols have proven their mettle over the years. While they may not be pretty, they are reliable, and in train hands, pretty darn combat accurate. I have published review videos for both the G23 and G30S, and thought that this would be an opportune time for a comparison of the two. I have placed links to those reviews in the description section. This video review, however, places both pistols in one package for a somewhat side-by-side -side comparison of the two. So, stay tuned while I tell you all about the Glock G23 Gen 4 and the G30S, and why I placed one over the other for my EDC. To begin with, let me roll the specifications for each caliber of ammunition that I am using for this evaluation. Then, I'll run the specifications for each pistol used in this comparison.
The G23 is, of course, the compact version of the G22, standard for this line of Glock pistols, and which has been accepted by many as a full-size service pistol with its 15-round capacity. The G23, although the standard capacity is 13 rounds, will accept G22 magazines without issue. Comparable in size to the G19 9mm, the G23 steps it up a bit, with the chambering of the 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge, or as I call it, the 10mm short. This one was found used in excellent, but not perfect condition, neither a thorough cleaning, and the disconnector had to be replaced before it could be considered serviceable. The stock lock polymer sights had been replaced with night sights, and I do like the green front sight, as it stands out for me more than others. That said, all indications point to a law enforcement G23 Gen 4 version over the standard G23, according to the Glock website, with a predominant indicator being the grip texture. The slide width is a hair wider than the G19, with a 1.08 inch width, as compared to a 1.0 inch width. The height is 5.51 inches, with a standard magazine and is about one half inch taller than a G19, with a grip giving me a tad more space for the support fingers to grab. G19 grip was just a bit too short for my liking, and I favor the grip of the G23 more. This version of the G23 has replaceable grip adapters, and the thickest of the two with beaver tail was installed, which pleases my hand immensely. This version does not have the flare at the bottom of the grip, as does the Gen 5, but I have never given that flare much thought in the first place. The overall width of the G23 is the same as the G19, making the grip feel right at home in the hand. As far as the left side only slide lock, I have no qualms with it being left side only, as I am familiar with such. The grip texture is much better than the non-law enforcement version, that is welcomed, as is the larger magazine catch and release button over the small rectangular version. The magazine catch and release button can be transferred to the right side for those who prefer such placement. The trigger is standard Glock with a pull weight of 28 newtons versus 26 newtons of the Gen 5 version. But newtons mean nothing to me, unless we are talking about big newtons accompanied by a glass of milk for full enjoyment. Since this G23 was used, I expected a lower than advertised trigger pull weight, and I was right. Coming in at 2 pounds, 3.8 ounces with a 5 pull average, the trigger has the usual take up and spongy feel that stages the striker just before let off, followed by a very satisfying striker release and no trigger over travel. 
finish is excellent, with just a minor bit of holster wear at the muzzle end, and just a tad of finish wear on top of the slide release lever. As a last feature note, did you know that the G23 is a convertible? That's right. The G23 converts to 357 SIG or 9mm with a simple barrel swap. The Glock G30S can be compared to plenty of other Glock pistols, including the entire clan of 45 AC pistols that it belongs to. With the G30, Glock's goal was to produce a subcompact pistol to the G21 and G41. With the G30S, Glock's goal was to create a subcompact pistol in 45 ACP with a thinner profile and a lighter carry weight than the G30 yet maintain the same capacity as the G30 of 10 plus 1 rounds, but which competes with the 6 plus 1 round G36 for user selection. The 3.78 inch barrel with its very wide opening at the muzzle is the same as the G30, but with a thinner slide. And yes, the barrel is polygonal rifled and is somewhat thinner in wall thickness to the G30. An accessory rail with a one-point mount adorns the bottom of the frame, which is a common sight to see these days. It does tempt me, at times, to mount a good laser on the front of this little beast. And speaking of sights, the sights are box stock lock polymer, but the sights can be changed to something more desirable. Although I have never had an issue with stock lock sights, I did opt for the XS Sights 3-dot tritium night sights that I favored just a bit more. Looking at the left side of the G30S, nothing looks out of place, including the slide markings. On the right side, there is a nicely formed hole in the slide for extended shells to come out, and which does its job well. Just below that, you will find the serial number in its usual place on the slide, and also on the bottom front of the frame. Just behind the ejection port is the external extractor. It does an excellent job of pulling spent cases from the chamber. The slide width is slimmer than the G21 and G30, but is the same as the G36 and G41 at 1.0 inch. Beveling at the top and front removes some of the blocky glock look to it. Peering down the sights reveals that the slide is really not all that blocky and is on par with most pistol slide widths on the market. The trigger housing is typical clock with its contoured front with front serrations, undercutting at the rear and enough air space to house a gloved hand. The trigger is ridged and rounded like all glocks and incorporates the standard glock trigger safety lever that must be pressed for the trigger to slide into the frame. Trigger still provides that all familiar free play and heavy sponge and release feel that has caused many of us to develop a love-hate relationship with Glock triggers. Of course, the Glock safety system is evident in the G30S. This specimen has a 3-pound, 4.36-ounce trigger pull weight with a 5-pole average. Both complain about the Glock triggers, but for myself, I find a trigger operation and pull weight just about right for a stressful situation. This one has a trigger pull weight that is less than some 1911 pistols, but with a different feel. The grip width is as thick as its bigger brothers, the G21 and G41, which means that it feels small to me. The grip is devoid of adapters that can somewhat tailor your hand to the grip, at least with trigger reach. Two finger grooves adorn the front of the grip, and those as with the stock lock sights, are a thorn of contention for some. For me, they are spaced about right for my fingers. If equipped with a 9-round magazine with the flush base plate, grip length can be somewhat lacking in real estate. 
With a 10-round magazine, however, there is enough real estate for my little finger to rest against. However, I have exchanged the base plates on two of my magazines with GVN grip extensions for evaluation that have a bit of a lip on them that helps me hook the grip when drawing from a holster and also can assist in snatching the magazine from the magwell, if need be. Two other magazines remain equipped with the standard base plates. The results of my evaluation will determine which will be the chosen one. The grip texture is that of the Gen 3 Glocks, and the rear and front of the grip is highly textured, which affords a pretty good gripping surface for my hand to press against. The sides of the grips, however, I still find slippery in nature. Some Talon rubberized grip tape may find its way onto the grip. I don't want to increase the grip girth, just give it more substance. In my fantasy, I see a treatment somewhat to the G30S as was done with the G45. Keep the slide length and put a G21 frame under it, giving it more capacity, but in doing so would take away from the concealment factor. So I'll let my fantasy fly away like a bird on a wing. On the left side of the frame, the slide stop also does its job well to lock back the slide on an empty magazine. Like most glide slide stops, the button is small and lacking in real estate for the thumb to have any real control over it to release the slide, should it be used as such. Fortunately, there are enough serrations at the rear of the slide to accommodate moving the slide to the rear for chambering or locking the slide back. But that said, Captivated Recoil Spring Guide Rod Assembly has a substantial spring rate, a spring rate enough to warrant some gripping strength when attempting to move the slide. No front slide serrations are provided. The disassembly magazine is its usual small cell that I find contentious at times to manipulate. And yes, the G30S, like the G36, has the leaf spring for the takedown assembly, rather than the newer coil spring. Last but not least is the magazine and magazine catch and release button. The Gen 3 era magazine button is a small rectangular and serrated affair, and like the G36, it cannot be swapped to the right side. The magazines are the usual Glock polymer wrap metal units that are clearly marked for 45 ACP ammunition, and that, when loaded, can be seen through witness holes. Regardless if you happen to have a 9-round magazine or a 10-round magazine, that last round can be contentious to top off the magazine. The magazines in this specimen fit more loosely than I am accustomed to with Glock pistols. While the magazines for my G21 and G41 do have some play in them, magazines for the G30S have quite a bit more play, to the point of rattling a bit when locked into place. But to defect performance, We'll see during the range segment. The last item on my hit list is the lack of grip adapter, as found on the G21 and G41 Gen 4 models. The trigger reach on the G30SF, G21, G41, and G30S is identical at 2.85 inches, as compared to 2.95 inches of the G36. Go figure. While I am the one that will install the largest grip adapter on any Glock that has them, I find the trigger reach of the G30S just fine, and I can live with it. Unless I can't. The appearance of the G30S is like that of any Glock. All business. But you can take pleasure in shooting the G30S, and I think that is where we need to go from here. So, let's do that. My goal for today is to run a side-by-side, shot-by-shot comparison between the Glock G23 Gen 4 in 40 Smith & Wesson and the G30S chambered in 45 ACP. While the G23 is considered, according to Glock, as a compact pistol, 
G30S is a subcompact pistol. The barrel length of the G23 Gen 4 is 4.02 inches as compared to the 3.87 inch barrel of the G30S. The biggest factor, I feel, that would affect my operating both is the difference in height that translates to a difference in grip length. The G23 Gen 4 height is 5.04 inches compared to the 4.80 inches of the G30S. In short, no pun intended, the G23 simply has more handle to hold than the G30S. I will be shooting Nosler JHP ammunition through both pistols. Rated at 1,005 feet per second, the 180 grain 40 Smith & Wesson is as close as I could get to the 185 grain 45 ACP round by Nosler and which is rated at 915 feet per second. I have no way of chronographing either round, but I do suspect that neither will meet the manufacturer's ratings. With that said, I do suspect that both would do in a self-defense scenario. For the first exercise, I'll shoot one round from the G23, then one round from the G30S. I'll swap back and forth until six rounds in each magazine is expended. Then, I'll fire six rounds from the G23 and follow that with six rounds from the G30S. Finally, I'll load nine rounds in each mag and then fire three three-round Mozambique strings until each magazine is empty. I'll do a comparison range day synopsis at the end to compare shooting categories for each pistol, categories of which I will reveal when I get to that point. So... Let's get going with some shooting, with the G23 Gen 4 up first.
the G23 Gen 4 weighs in at 31.39 ounces with a full complement of 13 rounds of 40 Smith & Wesson. For comparison, the G30S weighs 30.16 ounces with a full complement of 10 45 ACP rounds. That is only 1.23 ounces difference between the two, and I gained two rounds, three rounds if you consider one in the chamber with a full magazine. My carry means for the G23 consist of a Galco King Tuck holster, but also works well with the G30S, G36, and other pistols of comparable size. There is also the Alien Gear Cloak Tuck 3.5 for the Glock G21, G22, G20, and G30. That works well with the G23 and G36, and which I can quickly set up for strong side or cross draw carry, the latter of which is becoming a favorite of mine with the exception of the Galco Classic Lite 2.0 shoulder system for autos that has become my favorite for shoulder carry. I have been carrying the G30S and G36 in this holster for a short while and transferred the G23 to it with no issue, and it is the most pleasing way to carry. The holster is versatile, as it also works with some non-Glock pistols. These holsters are my choices, and your preferences may differ. You should carry in a holster and method that works for you. Just carry in a safe manner. Well, let's get to my final impression. Well, I hope that you found this chapter of the Range Ronin Chronicles interesting. Comparison between two pistols will always be controversial, but my goal with this comparison was to shed some light not only between 40 Smith & Wesson and 45 ACP, but also two pistols that many, including myself, would pack for everyday carry and who also might consider them as an all-reason, all-season carry. Between a 180 grain 40 Smith & Wesson round or a 185 grain 45 ACP round, the possibility of stopping a viable threat when fired, while no guarantee, certainly evens the playing field. I do feel at home with the G23, as I do the G30S. However, I feel more at home with the G23. The physical size of the pistol agrees with my hand as compared to the G30S, with the difference primarily being in grip length. If the grip length of the G30S was longer, it would have qualified. As far as caliber, I do look at the 40 Smith & Wesson as a trade-off round, but I am not trading off as much as I would be with the 9mm, in my humble opinion. While the 9mm is a mellow fellow to shoot, and advances in bullet technology has improved the ballistics of the 9mm, the 40 provides me with the feeling that, while I am not shooting a major caliber, I am shooting a caliber of substance. Obviously, the ammunition that I use for this comparison are not to say all end all choices, because there are plenty of other choices, like the 165 grain critical defense FTX for the 40 and the Corbon 165 grain 45 ACP plus B. My two favorite defensive loads are the Sig Sauer 45 ACP Elite V Crown JHP 185 grain at a rated 995 feet per second, or the 40 Smith & Wesson Elite V Crown Jacketed Hollow Point 165 grain at 1,090 feet per second but I am currently stoking the G23 with 40 Smith & Wesson Elite V-Crown 180 grain JHP and the G30S with 6 hour 45 ACP Elite V-Crown JHP 185 grain that, I feel, will still take care of business. Your choice of firearms and defensive loads to stoke them with are, of course, your choice. And I am sure that you will be fine with whatever your selection may be, regardless of caliber. For me, the G23 Gen 4 is going to be my prime carry for a while. That may change with my women whimsy and future findings.
So, my friends, I hope that you like this comparison between the Glock G23 Gen 4 and the G30S, and will return for more of my rambling reviews. But for now, it's time to close this chapter. Stay tuned to the channel, and please return, as more gun and gear reviews are forthcoming. Until you grace me with your presence on this channel again, stay vigilant, stay armed, and stay safe out there.